And welcome again to another installment of GAR Hall Special Event Zoom Edition. It's nice to see so many familiar faces and lots of new faces too over the last month or so. So tonight we've got a great presentation with uh, Sean Quigley who is with the National Park Service. Um, the Boston Underground, the Boston Maritime Underground Railroad. And um, in two weeks, we're going to have sort of a companion to tonight's presentation, which will be on um, the Boston Women of the Underground Railroad. And that will be one of Sean's um, colleagues that will give that presentation. Then in June, we've got John Forte, the um, heirloom gardener. And then we have got a a short documentary on Blanche Ames Ames. Um, if anyone knows who she is, and if you don't, you can, I'm not gonna get into the whole thing. You can look her up. It's a fabulous story and we're thrilled to bring that to you as well. Again, the um, society is happy to have you here. Um, we do not charge for these presentations. Through this whole pandemic, we've wanted to keep the community engaged we're thrilled that you've, you've been able to be with us. We have people from all over the country. We've had presenters from all over the country and it's been wonderful. But if you feel like you'd like to and you're able to make a donation, we would gladly accept it and we would appreciate it. I will put the information in the chat section for you. So without any further ado, I am going to bring in Sean Quigley and um, enjoy. Thank you very much. And uh, I will share my screen momentarily. I did just want to say though, uh, I am, as you can tell by at least the, the top half uh, here, I am a National Park Ranger, you can see by the arrowhead, working for the National Parks of Boston. Now the National Parks of Boston are three individually legislated national parks in the downtown Boston area. Uh, I have spent the majority of my career working for Boston African American National Historic Site located on the north slope of Beacon Hill uh, and focuses, it's a park that focuses on the history of Boston's free African American community in the 19th century, uh, really more specifically from the American Revolution through the Civil War. Uh, one of the most visited national parks in the Boston area uh, and one that I'm sure a lot of folks here are familiar with is Boston National Historical Park. Uh, which encompasses the Freedom Trail uh, and really focuses on the events um, in Boston's role in those events leading up to the American Revolution. And then finally, there is Boston, the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park, um, which includes uh, 30 plus uh, Harbor Islands and is, you know, a wonderful resource. So tonight's presentation is kind of a lack of a better term like a marriage, if you will, between uh, the work that I've done with Boston African American National Historic Site, as well as some of the research that I also have done when I worked for a summer with the Boston Harbor Islands. Uh, and the result of that research, uh, Revolutionary Harbor, Boston's Maritime Underground Railroad. So with the introduction of the parks uh, out of the way and kind of talking about the organization that I work for, uh, I do want to ask and um, feel free if anybody would like to drop uh, some answers in the chat. Um, when I say Underground Railroad, what are some of the things that come to mind? And that can be people, places, events, you know, objects, whatever comes to mind. So feel free to take like 30 seconds, think about it and drop some answers in the chat. All right, so, so far we have uh, from Janice Owens, we have Harriet Tubman as well as safe houses. Uh, Michael also says Harriet Tubman, uh, Richard transportation of people. Uh, Robert, Charles Turner Torrey from Situate. Yes, absolutely, we'll, we'll touch base about him a little bit later. Uncle Tom's cabin, being chased under difficult circumstances from Sue. Uh, Jackson Homestead from Edward. I do apologize, Michael said Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, so that's, that's great. I think these are, these are great examples. And you know, if you, you do have others, please feel free to drop them in. Uh, I'll come back to the chat in a little bit. Secret places and houses to hide slaves from Stephen, absolutely. So 
This is great because there are, you know, I think a, a great range of examples of what people think of with the Underground Railroad, right? You have Harriet Tubman, who is featured here in this image that I have, you know, safe houses, um, people escaping from enslavement and under very difficult circumstances. You know, um, Harriet Tubman, very well known, safe houses, very well known. And then also some, some more kind of localized history, right? With Charles Torrey, born in Situate, um, the Jackson Homestead, uh, also a local site on the Underground Railroad. So this is a history that, you know, I think is something that really does kind of capture um, a lot of what people think of, you know, kind of that American mythology almost. It's something that really, you know, is swept up into that American mythology to the point that, you know, we know that it existed. Harriet Tubman obviously was a real person, but you have these images here, these these depictions, these pictures. It's something that almost doesn't seem real in a sense of like Paul Revere's ride, something that we know that happened, but it's been so woven into that American mythology that, you know, it, it it's, it's almost kind of sometimes can be hard to connect to. But the Underground Railroad is very real. And the perceptions of the Underground Railroad is this kind of overland route, these safe houses, these spaces where, you know, Harriet Tubman is going into the South, stealing or helping liberate, I should say, enslaved people, bringing them to the North, um, you know, traveling by the North Star, these secret passageways, hidden tunnels, right? These are all things that really come to mind when we think of the Underground Railroad. But, you know, obviously, as you can tell by the, the name of my presentation, uh, we're looking at it through more of a maritime lens, which, which might seem a little bit surprising. Um, but many fugitives, especially those that were coming from coastal cities, would actually escape via ship as a stowaway. And this was something that happened um, you know, as far as the Underground Railroad went, fairly frequently. Uh, important abolitionist centers such as New Bedford, Boston, New York City. Uh, we have evidence of fugitives, you know, escaping via ship and going to those spaces. Um, and, you know, this was something that in real time was being discussed. Um, a newspaper editor from a um, a newspaper from Wilmington, North Carolina, actually wrote in, a, in an edition from the 1840s, um, it is almost an everyday occurrence for our Negro slaves to take passage aboard a ship and go north. This was something that was being written about. This was something that was being acknowledged during the 19th century. And it's also something that Boston did play an important role in. Now, kind of before I dive into the, the stories and the history here, I did want to give everybody at least a visual of the Harbor Islands so you could kind of place where some of these spaces were when I talk about these stories. There we go. So I do realize and I apologize that this image is a little bit blurry. Um, I've been looking for a really good image and was unable to find one, but I did want to at least present one of these maps for you. So Boston would be over here. Um, and what we're gonna be talking about today are Spectacle Island, which is one of the most visited islands um, as a recreation space today, as well as George's Island and Lovell's Island. This was the main way that ships would come into Boston you know, right along Nantasket Sound, coming around Hull and going in this area called the Narrows and then eventually making their way to Boston Harbor. So with that, again, the Underground Railroad, often what comes to mind, you know, the Harriet Tubman, the secret passageways, but there are plenty of other stories, such as the story of a man named George and his escape that involved Spectacle Island. So I don't know if anybody here has been to Spectacle Island, um, but if you have, you know that it is one of the most beautiful spaces in Boston Harbor. It's got the tallest point in the harbor. This is a picture from the tallest point in the harbor. You get a phenomenal view of the skyline. It's a place that you can, you know, you're just a half hour boat ride from the city. You can escape and really, you know, take in the trails and all the things that Spectacle has to offer. 
What was interesting about Spectacle Island was it definitely did not always look like it does today. Uh, initially, it actually served as Boston's landfill. Um, it was where a lot of trash would have been placed, but prior to that, it had a small community. Uh, it also had, at one point, two hotels on it. And the island was much smaller. It had two drumlins, so kind of elevated spaces, and then a small strip of land that connected them. It kind of looked like spectacles, hence the name of the island. And it does play an important role in this story. So in September of 1846, a man by the name of George was discovered on board a ship called the Ottoman. Now, the Ottoman was a ship that was owned by a Boston merchant and traded uh, with you know, southern port cities, mainly New Orleans. George was discovered on board, and the ship captain, a man named James Hannum, was determined to bring him back to New Orleans and back to the institution of slavery. His determination was based upon laws that were passed by the South and because of consequences that may have come to him uh, if he had been discovered to you know, let a, a stowaway escape. And I'll get into some of those consequences a little bit later on. So what happens is when the stowaway is discovered, George, uh, Hannum decides, you know, we, we have to make sure that we bring George back to the institution of slavery. They're waiting in the harbor for winds to change so they can leave. Winds haven't changed, so Hannum decides that, you know, while they're waiting, he's actually going to go to Spectacle Island uh, in order to get, in his words, a drop of consolation. He's going to grab a drink at the island's bar. He takes George with him under guard. But while Hannum is getting his drink at one of the Spectacle Island hotels, George steals Hannum's small boat and actually takes off for South Boston. This is an article uh, that Hannum later wrote, um, and it's an article that also describes the case. So George takes off to South Boston. Hannum realizes what has happened and takes another boat, takes off after George, and begins to chase him. That chase continues on land over a mile where George is running through fields over fences. Hannum and his men are chasing him, and then they finally get George at a bridge. A crowd has gathered. Hannum says that George is wanted for robbery, obviously a false charge, grabs George and takes him back to his boat. Abolitionists in Boston get word of what has happened. When they get word of this, they actually get a judge to swear out a warrant for Hannum's arrest under the charges of kidnapping. Hannum knows that his time is limited, so what he decides to do is he actually locates a ship. The ship's name is the Niagara. The Niagara is going back to New Orleans and it is a steamship, so it doesn't have to wait for winds. What Hannum ends up doing is he is going to transfer George to this ship. As he is transferring George to the Niagara, he looks up and as he describes, I discovered a steamer making directly for us. Knowing she could chase but one, I steered a course opposite to the Niagara. Bayonets glistened in all parts of the boat. What Hannum is describing is a ship full of abolitionists, white and black, armed with weapons to try and overtake Captain Hannum's ship, the Ottoman, to rescue George. Unfortunately for the abolitionists though, the exchange of George to the Niagara, the ship going to New Orleans, has already happened. Hannum, as he said, steered a course opposite the Niagara. So the abolitionists in one boat could only follow either, Ni either the Niagara or the Ottoman. They followed the Ottoman. George was returned to the institution of slavery. Now, Though this story does not have, you know, necessarily a you know, positive ending for George um, or kind of that positive ending that we often think of when we think of the Underground Railroad, what I do think about this story is that it is important because it really sets up three main points that I'm going to kind of go back to as we're talking about uh, these stories. 
And they are the uh, determination and agency of an individual escaping enslavement. Now, how determined somebody like George was to escape the horrors of that institution. It also highlights the resolve of ship captains when stowaways were discovered to bring them back to the institution of slavery. And then finally, it also highlights the boldness of groups on the mainland, in Boston, and in other spaces that were willing to go to extreme measures in order to assist the rescue of those who are escaping enslavement, freedom seekers on the Underground Railroad. I kind of want to look at these three main individual choices. And the way that I kind of set this up was looking at it through essentially a journey, looking at it from places where people were enslaved, how they would have escaped, what happens if they were caught, what happens if they made it, and who here in Boston uh, was trying to help them. So, why maritime ports? Why port cities? How were enslaved people able to escape from these port cities? Now, this is an example here. This is a uh, sketch of a um, harbor in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. So, for enslaved people in, in southern states that, you know, were very far away from northern cities, like, say, a Wilmington, North Carolina, or a, um, you know, New Orleans, it's basically impossible for them to actually escape via overland routes, um, you know, going through woods, you know, finding safe houses on the Underground Railroad. I mean, this is hundreds thousands of miles to get to a safer space. But if you're able to get on board a ship, you can get to a northern port much quicker. In fact, um, one historian uh, kind of mapped this out a little bit, a man named Gary Collison, and he talked about actually how from Norfolk, Virginia to Boston is about 567 miles. Now, obviously, you're walking that, you know, getting to a northern space is, is hundreds of miles. But with good headwinds, you could get from Norfolk, Virginia to Boston in about four days. So it's weighing that risk, right? So it's, it's a quicker time. Another thing that made this easier for people to escape enslavement was the maritime culture itself. Ships are coming in and out. Commerce is happening. You know, these are lively, vibrant places where you're constantly running into strangers and there's more of an opportunity to maybe slip on board of a boat because there were free African Americans who worked on ships that traded with the South. The maritime culture was very fluid. And this was one of the key spaces of employment in the 19th century for African-American men. Pay was not great, but once you're out at sea and you're on a boat and you have a crew, you know, of 30, 40, 50 men, you know, it's a much more equal space than on, you know, the mainland or in many of these cities. And as one historian said, you know, this maritime culture, provided runaways a complex network of informants, messengers, go-betweens, and other potential collaborators. With individuals being free and working on ships, if an enslaved person came up to them, they might be able to find a sympathetic deckhand. They might even be able to find a sympathetic captain. Or they might find somebody that they could bribe, pay to get on board that ship that's bound north. Or maybe they might just sneak on board themselves and hope that they are not discovered and that they are able to escape once docked in a northern port. So because of this, you know, kind of loose um, culture, these, these spaces where people are coming and going, it does provide those opportunities. But still, this is an extremely dangerous endeavor. Because enslavers, slave masters, they do not want enslaved people to successfully escape. They went to extreme measures in order to prevent this. And what you see here is an example. Um, it's obviously a sketch of 
uh, the mayor and police boarding a ship, literally hacking it up, looking for enslaved people or stowaways on board. There are reports of enslavers boarding ships and smoking them out with things like tobacco and sulfur, literally to try and get people who might be on board of a ship to come up for air, to give up their hiding space. And, you know, with these grave dangers, it's, it doesn't stop once the ship leaves the harbor. They could still be discovered. There could be a shipwreck. They could encounter bad weather, be at sea for weeks. You know, and I think it's also important to note that enslaved people, when they are stowing away on a ship, they're not staying in a cabin. They're not roaming around on deck. They were likely hiding in small, dark, cramped spaces, carrying, you know, limited food and water, anything that they could, you know, literally carry with them. We actually, I have a report of one man named William Grimes who escaped uh, enslavement by kind of literally like carving out a space in a bale of cotton and using that to sneak on board and stay inside while, you know, that ship journeyed north and I believe eventually came to New Bedford. Um, so, you know, this is, this is by no means a, a, a kind of glamorous, easy journey. So in addition to, you know, the dangers that enslaved people face when they're escaping on ships, you know, there are also the consequences of what happens when you're caught. And for these consequences, I want to look at, you know, what enslaved people face as well as ship captains. So these are some, these, these two images, um, they are photographs and they are a little bit, you know, more ex on the extreme end. So I do just, just want to clarify that before I, you know, show them. But what you see here on the left side, that is the hand of a ship captain. I'm gonna talk about that in one moment. What you see on the right side, this is a man named Wilson Chin who escaped from enslavement and you know, made his way north and eventually gained his freedom. And this is a photograph um, where he is showcasing different things that slave masters and slavers used to prevent fugitives from escaping or you know, is punishment when they were caught. You see there's an iron bar literally attached to the upper thigh and the ankle with chains on it to, you know, not allow people to run. That thing you see on a neck would have bells on it. So these are like inhumane, cruel things that, you know, again, these are the grave consequences that people escaping from enslavement would face. And then there's obviously the risk of if you're caught and you're brought back to wherever you were enslaved, you might be sold. You might have a family at that plantation. You might never see them again. So these are the decisions that people would have to weigh when they made that nearly impossible decision to escape. Now, as I said on the left here, this is the hand of a ship captain. Uh, and this man's name is Jonathan Walker. Uh, he was from New England, and he actually assisted freedom seekers by using his boat to take them uh, from southern port cities to the north. He's caught, and he's, what you see on his hand is a brand. He's literally branded on his hand SS for slave stealer. So this is what people faced. Um, you know, I mean, this, this is, again, the Underground Railroad with that, within that mythology, um, you know, really kind of highlighting people like Harriet Tubman, the North Star, as I said, you know, there, there are really dark and grave consequences that people face within this system. So the goal when escaping from enslavement, you know, is to obviously make it to a space where slavery no longer exists, a space like Boston, um, where you might find a community of abolitionists, a community that, you know, is opening their door to freedom seekers, communities that have underground railroad safe houses. And this is another map of Boston Harbor and kind of showing, you know, again, this is a space where people wanted to get to. They wanted to come here. But because of the success of freedom seekers, because of the success of Underground Railroad operatives, what you actually have happening is an additional consequence that still put people at risk even when they arrived in spaces like Boston. 
that is the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was passed by the United States government, and essentially what it does is it allows for United States marshals who are, you know, full backing of the federal government to serve as slave catchers, coming into any northern state or territory and essentially kidnapping people, re-enslaving them. The law also stated that if you were caught with a fugitive in your home, you would pay a thousand dollar fine, which in 1850, you know, thousand dollars today, that's roughly thirty-three thousand dollars. You could also go to jail for six months. The law naturally scares a lot of people in the north. And it also, you know, again, this is another reason why ship captains were very determined to return those that they discovered on board their ships. And what this also speaks to is, again, the willingness, bravery, and courage of those who escape enslavement to take matters into their own hands. And I think a really good example of someone who does that is a man named Philip Smith. So what you're looking at here is a clipping of a newspaper um, headline. And as you can see, escape of a fugitive slave from a vessel in Boston Harbor. You know, read those first few lines. The city was not a little electrified yesterday, says the Boston Atlas and B of Wednesday morning, hearing that a fugitive slave has made good his escape and was on his way to that land of freedom, Canada. Now what happens is this ship coming from Wilmington, North Carolina, discovers this stowaway on board, a man named Philip Smith. He's discovered in between George's Island and Lovell's Island. Again, that area that's known as the Narrows. He's discovered, he's put under lock and key on board this ship. He's going to be returned to the institution of slavery. But in the middle of the night, and this is December, in the middle of the night, he's able to break out of that hold where he's being held. He literally rips a piece of the ship up, jumps overboard, and uses that as almost a makeshift kind of, you know, life raft, swims over to Lovell's Island, stays there overnight, until the next day he's able to hail a passing ship. Abolitionists ended up coming to this ship because they got word that he was on board, and the captain said he's gone. He had jumped overboard. And then they learned that abolitionists in the city were able to take Philip Smith in. Though, you know, again, middle of December, swimming in Boston Harbor, staying overnight on this island. But he escapes and he makes his way to Canada safely. So this network, right? Talked about ship captains, their determination. Talked about, you know, that determination of the individuals escaping enslavement. What about those people, those networks in Boston, on the mainland, that are assisting fugitives? Well, one organization um, that is really crucial in this, and you, know, you can kind of think of as actually like the financial backbone of the Underground Railroad in Boston, is a group called the Boston Vigilance Committee. Now, the Boston Vigilance Committee is actually created in the aftermath of that 1850 fugitive slave law that I was talking about. Um, what you see here on the left is a broadside or a poster that they paid for to, you know, kind of appear throughout Boston after the law was passed. Now, I know that someone did bring up Charles Tory uh, earlier, so I would, you know, be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, this Boston Vigilance Committee of 1850 is actually the third iteration of the Boston Vigilance Committee. The first iteration of the Boston Vigilance Committee was founded in, I wanna make sure I get the date right, I believe it was either late 1830s or early 1840s by none other than Charles Torrey, um, who was born in Situate um, and you know, was extremely underground railroad. There's you know, definitely a connection uh, in Situate to this organization. So the Boston Vigilance Committee, as I said, you can kind of think of as that financial backbone of the Underground Railroad. They are wealthy philanthropists who are reimbursing individuals for um, harboring fugitives. Um, and that's, you know, not only harboring fugitives, but they're paying people back for providing fugitives with food, clothing, shelter, etc. And one of the more powerful things about the Boston Vigilance Committee, specifically this iteration in 1850, is 
the meticulous records that they kept. And through those meticulous records, primary source, they really help us understand who was on, active in the Underground Railroad, money, how many people did they have in their house, This is an example of one of those pages, an example of an individual by the name of Austin Bierce, very active on the underground in Austin, but is a He looks all the part of someone who spent his life ships. Um, he grew up in Barnstable, Massachusetts, so he did not grow up, um, you know, in Boston. But working in Barnstable, he actually um, found work on ships that traded throughout the East Coast, including with the South and in slave states. And because of this work and because of this trade, Austin Beers actually has a first-hand experience with the horrors of the institution of slavery. He sees it with his own eyes. And some um, the ships that he was working on would actually have enslaved people. And he would write about this experience. Um, and in later in a memoir that is known as the Reminiscence of the Fugitive Slave Law Days. And I'll read a quote. So when he saw enslaved individuals, sometimes on board, he wrote, it was my business to pull off the hatches and warn them that it was time to separate. And the shrieks and cries at these times were enough to make anybody's heart ache. I no longer think it right to see these things in silence. I trade no more south of Mason and Dixon fly. He witnessed this, and because of this, you know, literally being a part of seeing families being separated, he determined that he was no longer going to trade. And he actually became very active as an abolitionist and on the Underground Railroad. So, looking at, you know, this ledger, um, I do see there's a request to read some of them. Um, so I will say, you know, just to kind of give you an example, as you see here on the left, you have the date, so you have the um, year, month, and you know, on the right hand side, you have the amount that people are being re reimbursed for. So for example, um, you have that first entry, James Scott, fugitive passage to Canada. So, you know, that's a man named James Scott who's helping a fugitive get to Canada. Um, you have Beer. So as you can see, Austin Beers' name is highlighted five times just on this one page. Um, the first one's a little bit harder to read, so I'll read his second one. Um, and this is to get that connection and that link to his work in the harbor. He is Austin Beers, boat in the harbor. Now sometimes that's all we get. Not very detailed, but it is a connection. There are other entries page specifically, but it talks about, you know, being reimbursed for rescuing a fugitive from the harbor. And that was one of the key things that Austin Beers did. Um, so, and again, what I can do too is um, I can share this account book. Um, it's free online. I can share it afterwards. I'll drop it as a link. Um, and then it can be zoomed in on and you can get a closer look at more of the pages if anybody is interested. Um, but for the purposes of this, I will save that till the very end. So Austin Bierce um, used his skills as a maritime, you know, leader to his advantage. Um, so this is an advertisement from a newspaper. Um, he owned this boat. It was called the Moby Dick. Uh, and as you can see here, Austin Bierce master lying at the ready um, for pleasure parties, fishing excursions in the harbor. 
So he's providing fishing excursions. He is taking people out on boat cruises. This is boat for by day. But by night, Austin Beers is using the Moby Dick to rescue fugitives from Boston Harbor that were stowing away on ships. Now this here is a sketch. Um, and as you can see, it says, landing a fugitive slave at Drake's Wharf, Wharf, South Boston, from the yacht Moby Dick, Captain Austin Beers on the night of July 18th, 1853. He used this to great effect in this. Now, one question that I often get is how did they know that stowaways were on board these ships? How did abolitionists get word of this? Well, there was a you know, strong network, again, of that abolitionists um, in Boston, white and black. Um, but often what would happen is ships would dock, you know, come in, dock outside, of the harbor and other ships would go out to meet them to help crews get to the mainland, but also sometimes to sell goods. Um, and one abolitionist by the name of Thomas Wentworth Higginson commented, and he wrote about this in one of his journal entries, kind of explaining how one of these connections would happen and how people would be aware of this. Higginson wrote, men used to go down to the harbor to meet Southern vessels. The practice was to take along a colored woman with fresh fruit pies, etc., and she easily got on board, and when there, usually found out if there was any fugitive on board. Ship captains did not see these women as threats. They did not believe that these women were doing anything other than selling things. But these African American women were getting on board these ships, getting word, and able to bring that back to abolitionists so people like Austin Bierce could act. Now, Austin Beers has a lot of very interesting stories, um, as you can imagine, but uh, one I do want to share with you uh, actually took place in September of 1854. Now, Beers got word that there was a fugitive on board a vessel. And it's another ship from Wilmington, North Carolina, an important trade partner um, in maritime routes with Boston. And he got word that this was a fugitive and that actually the ship captain wanted to give him up. But this information was faulty because when Austin Bierce, you know, pulls up alongside this ship, the captain tells him, and I'm quoting here, if you come alongside my vessel, I will send you into eternity damned quick. So Bierce realizes that this guy's not playing around. And it's late at night. He goes back to Long Wharf. And what he ends up doing is he can't find anybody. He wants to get like a crew of people so we can go back and overpower this vessel. He can't find anybody. So in a very bold um, move, what he ends up doing is he, he has this kind of, he has a bunch of coats and hats on board his ship. And it's nighttime. So he actually ends up fastening them to his boat to make it look like he's got a large crew, like hats, you know, coats in the dark. Pulls back up to the ship and tells him, you know, basically, I've returned. I have more men. What are you going to do about it? Give me the fugitive or there will be bloodshed. Captain hands over the fugitive. Austin Beers brings him back to Boston, puts him within this network, and actually ends up helping him escape to Canada, where he stays for the rest of his life as a free man. And Austin Beers writes in his memoirs that this individual actually does come back and visit him um, after the Emancipation Proclamation is passed. And interestingly enough, Bierce writes, and unfortunately I haven't been able to find this ad, I've looked for it plenty of times, but Bierce writes that um, the next day the ship captain uh, actually puts up an ad in the paper saying that pirates boarded his ship the previous night and offered a $500 reward for the person who headed the gang. So, um, you know, would love to find that ad, haven't been able to find it. I've, I've looked a lot for it, but, you know, I mean, I think that that just, again, kind of highlights, you know, he's, he's one example of many individuals that would have been, you know, crucial within this network. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I, these are, these are just a couple of the, the many stories that do, you know, exist within this network. Uh, and I do want to share just one more story before we close and open this up to questions. Um, and I do want to bring it back to, you know, the individuals escaping from enslavement, because, you know, these are the people who have to make this nearly impossible decision to do this, you know, at grave risk of themselves, um, you know, in coming to a space where they don't know anybody. They're going to a strange place, oftentimes alone. 
but they did so in order to fight and to gain their freedom. So the story I want to close with is the story of a young woman, uh, really a girl at the time that she escaped from enslavement, about 15 years old. Her name, Elizabeth Blakely. So Elizabeth Blakely, as far as we can tell, was enslaved in Wilmington, North Carolina. She determined that she wanted to escape, learned that there was a boat leaving for Boston. She boarded the boat and was staying in a small space. This is a sketch that was uh, done in the, I believe it was the early 1900s, um, talking about this story. So she's on board this ship and her enslaver, a man named George Davis, believes that she's on board. And he, according to newspaper reports, smokes out the vessel several times with tobacco and sulfur to try and get her to reveal herself. But she does not. She stays hidden in that tiny, small crawl space and the ship leaves. It is, again, December. It's cold. The vessel runs in a bad weather, out to sea for a couple of weeks, arrives in Boston. She escapes. And she's later brought on stage at Faneuil Hall um, by abolitionists for an anti-slavery meeting. And she will end up uh, moving to New Haven, Connecticut for a little while. She moves to Canada. And then she actually ends up moving back to the Massachusetts area. Uh, moves to uh, she lives in Somerville, Chelsea, and uh, actually returns to Faneuil Hall on the 100th anniversary of William Lloyd Garrison's birth um, in the early 1900s. And she will die in her 80s and is buried in the Woodlawn Cemetery in Everett. But I think her story is so powerful because, you know, I mean, as she later recalled, um, Wendell Phillips, a very famous abolitionist, you know, said he spoke to her and when he was recalling her story, he talked about, you know, her inhumane master, you know, smoking out this vessel. And he says that she told him while he was doing this, in her mind, there were two choices, liberty or death. And, you know, her story, like many from the Maritime Underground Railroad, is powerful, daring, and inspiring. You know, despite the incredible dangers and low odds of success, Elizabeth Blakely, Philip Smith, countless others, risked everything, and we're able to seize their freedom. And with that, I will stop sharing, and I'm happy to open it up to questions. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Anyone? Oh, you might all still be muted. Aha. There we go. Sue Gallagher looks Sorry like about she that. was asking. I think, Jean, I think Sue Gallagher was asking a question, but she's muted. Sue, you need to unmute. unmute. No, okay. She's unmuted now. Okay. Now I already forgot my question. No, actually. So were there other seacoast areas like was Portland, Maine developed or Marblehead or other areas where they were also doing this as well as in Boston? Yeah, so that, that definitely uh, did occur in other northern port cities. Um, Portland, you know, can definitely identify New Bedford. I don't want to speak to very specific towns like like Marblehead that you mentioned in other spaces that I haven't really done dove into those areas to research. 
Um, there's actually recently a book that just came out about this subject um, about literally like a month ago uh, that, you know, I, I haven't got my hands on yet, but definitely does more of a deep dive into this. Um, but, you know, I mean, this was something that was definitely occurring in, you know, those northern port cities that were abolitionist uh, strong areas. Um, again, my research has been focused on really Boston and, you know, because of that spillover and connections to New Bedford as well. Um, but this was not just limited to Boston. You know, I have been studying a lot of Boston, so that's, that's where I have the facts and the stories, which is obviously what I want to focus on. But, you know, this is an area that's ripe for a lot of research um, because it is, as I said, it's something that, you know, is not, it's an aspect of the Indian Railroad that's not looked at as much. But yeah, this was not limited to just Boston. Can, can, can I ask yep. a question? I'm, I'm not sure if I'm... We can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, well, this was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'm very interested because I think it's probably a nightmare doing research. And <laughs> I'm wondering what records there are, how difficult are they to find, to use, and where are they? <laughs> yeah, Patty, that's an excellent question. Uh, and, you know, I think, I think is one that, <laughs> right, it's a, uh, studying the Underground Railroad can be challenging at times because of the lack of sources or kind of where you have to find them, right? Because I think first and foremost, and I, I was talking to actually Gene about this at the very beginning um, when we were kind of doing our tech check and setting everything up, the Underground Railroad was illegal. So keeping records, you know, like the Boston Vigilance Committee, ultimately was like kind of a very risky thing to do, right? Because if you keep those records and they're discovered, everyone that's seen on board, if it falls, or everyone that's on, you know, paper that is discovered is at risk to, you know, go to jail, pay a fine, et cetera. So where records mainly lie are these sensational cases, right? Where you have like a Philip Smith who escapes, you know, by ripping a board off of a ship. That's something that's probably going to get covered in a local newspaper, especially anti-slavery newspapers. So that's one space to look. Um, we're fortunate that we do have the Boston Vigilance Committee records. Um, so, you know, being able to look through those to kind of get some names and look and see if there's any personal papers. Uh, there's also examples like Austin Beers who writes a reminisce, right? He writes a, uh, like a memoir um, in later years. So that's something that we can look to and then try to kind of take his stories and, you know, line them up with other sources uh, to corroborate them. There are letters uh, and then there's, you know, various meetings that might take place um, where, you know, you get stories like Elizabeth Blakely. Just as an example, the first time I ever heard about her was in Austin Bierce's memoir, talking about a meeting that took place, you know, 40 years before his story. For her, I was like, wow, this is a really fascinating story. Her name is spelt like 17 different ways. I was looking at newspapers, census records. Um, you know, in sometimes it's, you run into walls and you can't find anything. Like for example, George, I have no idea what happened to him when he got back to New Orleans. I don't even know his last name. So it's kind of these little nuggets of information that you're able to find in, in taking them from these different spaces and putting them together. You know, I'm very fortunate that I'm a historian in 2021 because I have the internet. I have the ability to go on to these databases and type names in and immediately get hits of, you know, a hundred newspapers from all over <laughs> Massachusetts and other spaces. So in that regard, I'm definitely very lucky, but you know, it, it, it absolutely can be frustrating at some times. We've got a few questions, actually quite a few questions in the chat. Um, what originally sparked your interest? Were you a child or an adult? Uh, so I would say that for history, I've always been interested. Um, I remember coming and doing the Freedom Trail in like the second and third grade. Um, <laughs> so that, that was always something I was interested in. But regarding kind of anti-slavery history and abolitionist history, that's definitely something that took place a little bit later in life. Um, I started working with the Park Service when I was uh, 
my a junior in college. Uh, so I'd say that, you know, that aspect of this history was something that was definitely sparked when I was, what was more, more of an adult working with this history. Um, and it, it you know, kind of led me to, to doing a lot of this research, so. Um, how many slaves typically were on a ship? So for stowaways, likely one, maybe two. Um, you know, I mean, you do have rare instances where, for example, uh, Jonathan Walker, the man who had slave stealer branded on his hand, his purpose was to go and rescue people. Um, so, you know, he's going to have people on board his ship uh, that, you know, he's going to have 10, 20 people. Um, now, if you're looking at like a slave ship, for example, that's going to be on like the Middle Passage, taking enslaved people, you know, captured Africans and bringing them to places in North America, South America, West Indies, et cetera. Uh, those, are, those are hundreds of people. Um, they are literally trying to pack as many people on board a ship as possible, um, you know. So uh, stowaways, definitely much smaller numbers. Okay. How successful was the railroad, freedom versus recapture? <laughs> So that's also a great question. And, you know, I don't have this in definitive, like, number terms. Um, you know, I've seen, you know, I guess you could kind of look at it as I've seen estimates by historians that say roughly 10, 20,000, you know, a couple tens of thousands of people escaped via the Underground Railroad looking at roughly like 1820s through the Civil War. And at the, time, at the time of the Civil War, 4 million people were enslaved. Now, obviously, not everyone who's enslaved is going to try to escape, but I think a lot of that is because of the deterrent factors that are put in place, those harsh punishments, the laws. You know, there are, um, in the South, there were groups that were literally referred to as slave patrols that would go in areas and, you know, make sure that if enslaved people are traveling, they have passes, you know, they're not where they're not supposed to be. So there are a lot of laws and, you know, threats of violence that are put in place to deter people. Now, when people really got up the courage to try and escape, I would say more often than not, they were captured. They were found out, plots were discovered before they even, you know, got off the ground. Um, so it was something that, you know, I mean, most fam one of the most famous fugitives, um, a man named Fred, you know, Frederick Douglass, uh, his first attempt to escape enslavement, someone in his group ratted him out, ratted that group out and the plot fell apart and that was discovered. So, you know, I mean, it was a very difficult thing to do because of how many laws and deterrents were put in place to prevent it. Okay, great. And um, would be in hopes that family would follow or was it strictly to free themselves? So that's like the heart-wrenching aspect of it, right? Escaping with an entire family is nearly impossible. And people escaping, you know, did so with the very, you know, real understanding that they may never see their family again, their loved ones again, if they successfully escape. Oftentimes, you know, it was easiest for, you know, adult men to attempt to escape. And there are reports of individuals who escape and then work to try to purchase the rest of their family. Um, you know, very rare occurrences, Harriet Tubman is going back and, you know, she's getting her family members and bringing them north. Um, you know, so I mean, that's, that's, again, that's the heart wrenching aspect of the institution of slavery. It's, you know, in, in a, the, the grave consequences that really weigh on whether you're going to escape or not, because, you know, even if obviously the institution of slavery is terrible, but you are weighing the thought of you might never see your family again. Now, there are those rare occurrences where families did escape together. Um, very notable example in Boston is of a man named Lewis Hayden, uh, who actually escaped enslavement from Kentucky with his wife, Harriet Hayden, and her young son, a uh, young boy named Joseph. They made it successfully, they settled in Boston, and they actually uh, ended up living uh, on Beacon Hill in a home that still stands today. Uh, so that did happen, but it was, it was rare.
Any other questions? Anybody else? I don't. That's great. And you said you were going to share something with us, Sean? Oh, right. Yes. At the end of the Here, presentation. Let me, let me pull it up for you. Oh, how many crew might be on the ship that could turn them in? Ooh, that's a good question. I think it depends Sorry. on the ship. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, most of these ships would probably have, uh, I think, and again, this is an estimate, so don't, don't quote me on this, but I would say probably like, you know, 20, 30, maybe upwards of 50 people on board of a ship, you know, as a, as a trading vessel. And, you know, I think it depends. Maybe there's one sympathetic deckhand, but if others discover them, they might turn them in. Um, so it was, it was definitely a risky endeavor, but I, I would have to look more into exactly numbers of crews on ships and how many people would be on board. I have a question. All right. oh, sorry. <laughs> Sean, um, did, would they know where the ship was going when they get on, or would they just take, take a, the stowaways, or would they just take a guess that it was going north? So this is, again, um, that's, again, a really good question, because obviously you want to make sure that you're not, like, you know, leaving Norfolk, Virginia and going to New Orleans, right? You want to you go up, <laughs> not down. Um, but this is where that kind of maritime culture and that network of like people coming and going would really be very, you know, crucial because, you know, if you know a dock hand, right, maybe this person is enslaved working the docks, they're not getting on a ship, but they know where ships are coming from and they can get you word that the ship is, you know, going, is heading to Boston or heading to Portland or heading somewhere north. Um, so, you know, I think because of that fluidity and kind of going back and forth, maybe you run into someone and you say, Hey, you're on, are you going to be on this ship? And it's like, yeah, we're leaving, going to Boston in two days. So I think, you know, you do best with obviously the intelligence you're given and, you know, you have to trust people. You have to trust strangers, um, oftentimes on this network, but because of that, you know, maritime culture on the docks, I think that people could get, you know, pretty solid information as to the direction that the ships that they were getting on were heading. Mm -hmm. I just know that I, I worked on the railroad and people would hop the train and they ended up in the wrong city. And they'd say, this is the second time I've ended up in Springfield. I'm trying to get to Philly. <laughs> So, well, yeah, yeah, right. Smart, and I, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I'm absolutely sure that that happened, you know, right? You know, maybe it was just, you know, because often there were some people that were just like, I'm going to do this myself. I see an opportunity. I'm going to take it. And I'm sure that that happened. Or someone got on a ship hoping that they were going to the right space and, and ended up going somewhere completely different. Mm. Um, you know, absolutely. Um, this is Patty Hayner again. I have another question. Can I? I'm sure. not sure if I've, <laughs> can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> um, yep. I, I, I can live... hear you. So, okay, great. I live in Norwell, which used to be a part of Situate, which had, back in the day, a huge shipbuilding enterprise, enterprises. Um, and I'm wondering... Um, thinking that that might have been a good location for a fugitive to try to get to. Um, what was it that made a place advantageous for them? What characteristics compared to other places that were maybe not so advantageous? Uh, sorry, I don't... <laughs> Oh, that, that's a great question. Like where, where, you know, where would you want to go? Um, I think that the reason why you get places like Boston and you get places like New Bedford and again, I keep going back to the oh, had a heart for the heartland. Um, that I know really well. Um, but it's a established community, mm -hmm. right? Boston has a, it's small, but it's a strong free black community. Um, again, that maritime culture, you know, that maritime, there's employment opportunities, which obviously is crucial. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you escape from enslavement, you go to a city like New Bedford, you can get on board of a ship and then you're a part of that crew and you can be on that ship for, you know, six months to a year if you're going out on a whaling vessel. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, so that's, that's something that is, that is important because that's more time that, you know, a fugitive slave catcher is not going to find you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, being able to blend in. Um, because if you're in these communities and there's, you know, people obviously kind of coming and going, you're less likely going to raise eyebrows. You know, I've seen letters where um, a fugitive escaped, came to Boston, settled, I think, I want to say it was Andover, or it was, it was one of, it was a town in Massachusetts, and the person who was harboring that fugitive wrote a letter back to Wendell Phillips in Boston and essentially said, you know, this person is the only, you know, African-American person in town. People are starting to ask questions. I'm going to ask that he comes back to Boston. So it's like, you know, finding that community, finding a space where people already have in opportunities for employment, I would say, are kind of one of the major drivers of where people are going when they're escaping enslavement. And ultimately, obviously, you want to be safe. Um, you know, so that's why you do see a lot of enslaved people going north to Canada. That's the safest destination because that's out of the jurisdiction of fugitive slavery.